How's everybody doing? Happy Father's Day to the fathers out there. Hallelujah. And there's no place I'd rather be than right here worshiping our Heavenly Father. Why don't you lift your hands with me? Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. Father God, we honor you. We thank you that you've called us sons and daughters. We thank you that you reconciled us back. You bought us back. You brought us back into relationship. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we praise you. Come on, it's going to be a good morning because we choose to make it a good morning, right? This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and I will be glad in Him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Why don't you sing this with me? We're singing, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. Yeah. All souls are toned by the blood of the Lamb. I'm not a slave to what once held me dim. How beautiful that cleansing flood. I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love. We're singing, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. child of God. Come on, sing it out with me. We're singing, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Come on, you sing it. How priceless. We're singing, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Ha! Uh -huh. 
thankful for his love this morning. Oh, he loves us. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Jesus. Oh, we thank you for your love. Glory to God. Oh, Jesus. Woo. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're surrounded by the love of the Father. Woo. And there's nothing better. Come on, there's nothing better. Well, I searched the world, but it couldn't fail me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Come on, sing it out. There's nothing better. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Sing, I'm not afraid. Well, I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Sing it out. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better. Oh, you could search the world and never find. Turning everything. 
every grave into a garden. You turn crazy into garden. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the
Hallelujah. <laughs> His goodness. His goodness. <laughs> so good. You know, when Moses hid in the cleft of the rock, that's what God showed him. His goodness. <laughs> it was his goodness. And his goodness is part of his glory. <laughs> his glory on our life, you know, when he's good to us. Others see it and they recognize him. David said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, we put ourselves in a place where we can see His goodness too. Part of it is our decision to dwell in His house, to dwell in that place. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you added. You know, these are times of addition for us. These are times where God's adding to our life. He's putting something in us of his goodness and of his glory so that we can be a testimony to the world. They need to see his goodness and his glory right now. Don't you agree? <laughs> but you're the one that's going to show them. Amen. God's faithful. He's faithful. Oh, and he's doing it in you and for you and through you. Amen. <laughs> what a good morning. <laughs> so glad everybody's here this morning. We celebrate our fathers this morning. We're so glad for all of our fathers here in the congregation and online. Yes, clap for them. <laughs> we appreciate our dads, we appreciate our fathers. So why don't you turn to somebody near you, a gentleman, a father, and just tell them this morning, Happy Father's Day. <laughs> What a good morning. What a good morning. So I want to uh, welcome everybody and just let you know that we have a digital connection card that you can connect with us and we can connect with you. And if you haven't uh, done this and, and maybe you're new to the church, if, you're, if you've been here and you're established, then you're getting uh, connected. But if you are new to the church, then text the word welcome to our number there, 970-624-0999, and we would love to get connected with you, let you know about things that are happening here at the church. Really, it's like a visitor's card. It's digital, though. Um, but if you want to know anything, um, if you have a question, if you have a test, Testimony. You can also use it that way. Let us know what's going on in your life. Let us know how you enjoyed the service. If something in the service changed your life, we are always looking and loving to hear those testimonies. And you can use this digital connection card for that too. We can connect in a number of ways. So uh, fill that out. Welcome. Text the word welcome to our number there. All right, and I have another announcement. Um, this week, something very special is happening. Justice Cry is presenting Ride for the Voiceless at the Rifle, uh, at Rifle, Garfield County Fairgrounds in Rifle. And uh, so tickets are $10, and it's really to end human trafficking. Maybe you have come to the Justice Cry Gala. This year, they're doing something different. It's the Ride for the Voiceless, and the uh, Westerners will be there. And so they do all kinds of incredible things. I'll read to you what uh, Jamie sent me. It's July 25th at 7 p.m. at the Rifle County Fairgrounds, or Garfield County Fairgrounds in Rifle. And uh, it's family fun filled evening with the incredible Western airs. Enjoy fast horses, skilled trick riding, and much more. All proceeds from this event will be donated to organizations on the front lines of human trafficking. And you can get your tickets at justicecry.com. You can also get them at any Alpine Bank from Glenwood Springs to Battlement Mesa. So if you go into the Alpine Bank, you can get your tickets there and you can get them at the door when you show up to the Garfield County Fair grounds. So it's really going to be a great event 
And uh, this is their fundraising event that they do for, for uh, this ministry, Justice Cry, which sows into rescuing those from human trafficking. So what a great opportunity to have some fun and to also really participate in a great cause and uh, lend our help as we are also receiving something wonderful, a fun evening out of it as well. So uh, that is coming up this Saturday, and we encourage you to participate. All right, let's watch the video announcements. Good morning, New Creation Church, and good morning, and a special thank you to those who helped in the NCC Golf Classic. Whether you sponsored, volunteered, or played in the event, I don't care if you lost 18 balls on 18 holes, it probably still was a blast because it went towards our preschool. So thank you so much. Now let's just jump right into these announcements, and you're not going to jump this week, okay? Stay put, and you stay put as well. Here's a reminder that the PRC van will be with us tonight. PRC standing for Pregnancy Resource Center, which is a center in Glenwood Springs and in Rifle that equips the women of our community. And their van is going to be here tonight. It's a traveling extension of what they do at the offices. They do traveling ultrasounds as well as other things. So come tonight, check out that van. Guys, and also, here's a reminder of the- Those are last week's announcements. And the PRC van will not be with us tonight. So, <laughs> but there are all kinds of other great things going on and happening here. So do we have the, the video for this week or we're working on it? Okay, so why don't you just put up a couple of the slides and we will just let you know in this service about a couple of things that are coming up and going on. And then in next service, we'll, we'll show the video. So Tim and Rhonda Rogers are going to be with us on August 7th. That's going to be a really fun night. They are going to, uh, or day, uh, they'll be with us for all three services. And they are always a blessing to the church. Um, also, we have a night of worship tonight. That is going to be awesome. And like we said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. So as you come tonight, expect to be added to. Expect for God to be speaking to you. It's going to be a really great night. All right, we have the summer encounter for all of our youth that's coming up this week. It's not too late to register. You can do that by going online. And once you register, uh, you'll be registered for all of the things that are happening. You'll have wonderful ministry from Matt Sheeran. He's going to be great. Also, uh, all kinds of fun things and food with that event, too. And then David Barton is coming on the 17th of August. He will be with us. He is a historian. He's going to talk about God and government. He's going to talk about our way to pray and really history and how history has proven that God is not apart or separate from government, but that he works through government as well. So we, we are really looking forward to him being here. And then for all of the men, Stand Tall Men's Conference is coming up. <laughs> And there is all kinds of great things planned for that. Again, talking about food, guys like food, right? <laughs> There's going to be lots of food uh, associated with this event. And, you know, Jerry's going to be cooking. And so... <laughs> <laughs> when he's cooking, there's more than enough. So uh, there's going to be a pre, uh, what is it called, tailgate party. A tailgate party, so pre-service uh, activities and fun and food. And then uh, wonderful guests that are going to be with us, the Beveres, Addison Bevere and John Bevere. And they will also stay over until the Sunday morning, so they'll be with us uh, that Sunday as well. So you want to set that time aside, men, and really dedicate your time to be ministered to, filled up, edified, encouraged, strengthened, and strengthened to stand tall in the place that God has for you. All right, well, I think that's, oh, and Dr. Avery Jackson, he's going to be with us next week. Um, he will be here, and he is a practicing neurosurgeon. And not only is he practicing neurosurgeon, he's a Christian. God has healed him in his body and uh, really revealed to him how science and medicine and the word of God work together. And so he ministers that everywhere that he goes, talking about spirit, soul, and body, how God connected us, not as separate beings, but as one, and how what we do with our spirit really affects our body. And so that is gonna be awesome. 
So I encourage you to be here all three services next week as he shares with us, and he has a book called The God Prescription. So it's an awesome book. Pastor Mark and I are are in it right now. It's wonderful. Um, So I encourage you to be here for that. All right, Freedom Sunday, if you'd like to be baptized on July 3rd, you can right now register for that. And then uh, we will have our one service outdoors at 9.30 a.m. And we will also have a picnic. So bring the picnic lunch for your family. We'll stay over after the service with the baptism, and it will be wonderful. We'll send you down the slide right into that pool in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. No, just kidding. (laughs) All right. Well, that is all the announcements for today. And Alan is coming to receive our morning tithes and offerings. Thank you. If you came and are prepared to give by cash or debit or credit card, raise your hands. The ushers will get you an envelope. If you're making out a check, make it out to New Creation Church. And if you're watching online and would like to participate, you can do that now. There's also ways to give up there. Thank you, as always, for your generosity and support of New Creation Church. You're a blessing. You're a blessing, so we can be a blessing. So praise God. And uh, in Proverbs 10.22, it says, The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. The blessing is our covenant. As you know, the blessing is our covenant that overrides the curse. It gives us authority over the curse or anything that, uh, that the curse is. And no sorrow means no heavy toil, no heavy burden comes with the blessing. So we don't have to strive for it. We don't have to work for it. We just have to believe and accept it. Amen? Just believe and accept it. In Mark 11, 22 and 23, familiar scripture, it says, So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, Believe that you receive them, and you will have them. And uh, as I was reading this, thinking about this this week, um, you know, I thought, I have a few mountains I'd like to cast into the sea. And, uh, and it was like immediately before I could even finish the thought, the Lord said, uh, spoke to me and said, do you think I see your mountains the same way you do? Do you, do you think I look at, them, at your mountains the way that you look at them? And uh, I said, I guess I get to find out. And... Uh, So then the next question he said is, do you know why I called David a man after my own heart? And um, and he said, one of the reasons is he sees things the way that I see them. He sees things the way that I see them. And go to Samuel, 1 Samuel 17, and you know this story, David and Goliath. In verse 23, it says, then he talked with them, and there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistine, and he spoke according to the same words, so David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, when they saw this giant, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. Then in verse 26, it says, Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? It says the men of Israel, they, were, they looked at the man. It says they looked at the man. He was a giant, and there's no way they could defeat him in their own strength. No way. And uh, uh, they were actually, it says they were dreadfully afraid. They were afraid for their lives. But David didn't see a giant, and he didn't see a midget. He saw somebody that wasn't in covenant with God. That's what he saw. He just saw an uncircumcised, somebody not in covenant with God. And David saw the battle as the Lord's because he was in covenant. Everything he goes through, the battle is the Lord's. So he could, he could... I mean, that's just, his attitude was, this isn't my battle. I don't have to face this alone. I don't have to go out and fight him in my own strength because the battle is the Lord's. And that made all the difference. That made all the difference in the world. And that's how God sees it. That's how God sees your mountains. He, he wants us to see them how he sees them. He doesn't, he doesn't look at them the way we see them. Um, they'd be too small anyway. Um, but Hebrews says we have a new and better covenant based on better promises. A new and better covenant based on better promises. So we can face the mountains and, uh, or our situations like David, not in our own strength, but with the authority that we have with our covenant with the creator of the universe. And so that makes all the difference, right? That makes all the difference. If you know that you know that you know that you know that the, you, the, the battle you're facing and the mountains that you have in front of you are not your own. So what is this sickness, disease, 
or anxiety, it can't attach itself to me. It cannot attach itself to me because I am in covenant with the creator of the universe. What is this lack? This lack can't, um, can't attack me because I'm a covenant child of God. It cannot attach itself to me. And there is nothing too hard for God. And that's how we need to stand and face our giants. Amen? So if it doesn't exist in heaven, Jesus said, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If it doesn't exist in heaven, we have authority over it here. We have authority over it here. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity to give. I thank you, Lord, that you're teaching us to prosper. You're leading us in the way that we should go. And, and Lord, I just pray that you would help each and every one of us here understand our covenant. Understand our covenant with you, Lord. You're a great and mighty God, and you've done so much. Your goodness, your goodness, just like we sang, just like they sang. Um, your goodness is so good. You are so good. Your goodness endures forever. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm gonna wait on you I'm gonna wait on you I've tasted your goodness I'm trusting your promise I'm gonna wait on you I'm gonna wait on you I've tasted your goodness I'm trusting your promise I'm gonna wait on you. Oh. Yeah. And I know you've ordered every step. Yeah, you are the author. But there's no predicting what is next. But you hold the future And all the questions They come second To the one I know is true You've always been true I'm gonna wait on you I'm gonna wait on you I've tasted your goodness I've trusted your promise I'm gonna It's your goodness I'm trusting your promise I'm gonna wait on shall mount up up on wings like an eagle and they soar they shall walk and not get weary they shall run 
and I faint. That's what happens when you wait. That's what happens when you wait. They that wait. They that wait on the Lord shall renew, renew their strength. They shall mount up, up on wings like an eagle, and they soar. They shall walk and not get weary. They shall run and not faint. That's what happens when you wait. You get a little stronger. That's what happens when you wait. You get a little stronger. They that wait on the Lord shall renew, renew their strength. They shall mount up, up on wings like an eagle. They shall walk and not get weary. They shall run and not faint. That's what happens when you wait. 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 I'm gonna wait on you. I'm gonna wait on you. I've tasted your good. Your goodness, how trust. Come on, sing, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. He will renew your strength. So wait, I say, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. He will renew. So wait, I say, wait on the Lord, oh, wait on the Lord, He will renew your strength. So wait, I say, I'm gonna wait on you, I'm gonna wait on you, I've tasted your goodness, I'm trusting your goodness I'm trusting your promise I'm gonna wait on you thank you Jesus hallelujah glory to God hallelujah, hallelujah. thank you Lord thank you Lord we worship you and we magnify you you're great and you're greatly to be praised. We thank you for this day that you have made for us. And we rejoice and we're glad in it. It's a day full of all that you have and all that you are. That as those who follow you, we get to partake of all that you have done for us. We get to partake of life and life to the overflow, your kind of life and your quality of life. And so we are so thankful and we wait on you. We allow that your presence, we allow your word to saturate our life, that we become one with you. As we wait on you, there's an intertwining, there's a oneness that we're joined to. So even today, as we come together, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're present in this place that every single person will have an encounter with you. The only one that can change a heart, the only one that knows the deepest things that have happened to us, the greatest things, the highest, the lowest. You know the reason that we're here today? We ask you to minister to every heart and every life, to impact as only you can do, to reveal yourself, and in that bring a revelation of all that you have for every individual. We ask you for utterance to speak as we ought to speak. Give us ears to hear what you're saying, that we might be thoroughly equipped. We thank you for the anointing that is here, that rests upon us, that is present in this place to break yokes of bondage. 
We command those things that have held people back from their divine destiny to be broken. We know it's a strategy of the enemy. It's not people that are holding us back, but it's the the lies of the enemy. And so we thank you that the anointing breaks every yoke of bondage, that we might go free, we might be delivered, we might be healed and made totally whole. That the brokenness would be bound up as if it had never been broken before. That our wholeness brings strength and liberty. The liberty by which Christ has made us free. So that we begin to understand that we are moving in a direction. That this time next year will be totally different for us. We'll no longer feel the brokenness and the stress and the bondage. But we'll know the freedom and the liberty by which Christ has made us free. So we thank you that you are here to move as you ought to move. We thank you for gifts placed in the body. To minister and to equip us for our work of ministry. Out wherever we are, wherever we go. That revival might take place. A stirring in our midst and in our city and in our our region, God, that there might be known the life of the Spirit of God, a supernatural way of living because of what you've done for us. And so we give you the glory and the honor, the praise and the thanksgiving for everything that will be accomplished in every heart and in every life by your word and by your spirit. We thank you for it ahead of time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, church. How are you this morning? Man, it's a great day to be alive. How many of you know God is on the move? Whether you see it or whether you know it or not, God is always working. He's at work right now by His Spirit on the inside of you. He's working right now. He's molding. He's making. He's shaping. He's forming things on the inside of you. The Bible says that He's ever at work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Jesus is right now standing before the Father. It says he lives, he ever lives. He's alive from the dead and he ever lives to make intercession for you. He's standing in the gap before the Father God on your behalf so that God's will can come to pass in your life. Come on, if you can't rejoice at that, there's a little bit of something going on. Your wood's wet. Come on, Jesus is right now not going to, right? He's right now standing in the gap for whatever is hindering you to bridge the gap to lay a hold of you and lay a hold of the Father that through Him, God's will can be accomplished in our life. Amen. And so that makes every day a great opportunity because every day, He doesn't take the week off and just show up and intercede for you on Sunday. But He ever lives It's his goal in life and eternity to stand in the gap for you so that God's goodness can be seen not only in you but through you. That everything that God planned when he sent Jesus to the cross to break the power of sin over your life that you might go free from all of that and live in an expression of God's goodness every single day. That's good news. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Why don't you look at somebody next to you and say, by the authority of God's word, you are not my problem. And if you believe that, you can be seated. Hallelujah, revelation that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. I want to say happy Father's Day to all the dads. We, we have a video for you. If you, we get it fixed, you want to stay uh, the next service, we do have a video to honor dads. It's a, uh, really a privilege in the day that we live in, the culture that we live in. Uh, really, uh, we desire, we're having a conference here in, in just a month uh, with John and Addison Bevere. We're also uh, working and, and beginning the, the beginnings of, of men's ministry here for a, a really, I believe, a divine purpose and a divine time. That it's really a time men to rise up and, and to really uh, show that. I mean, I, I think it's uh, somewhere around 14, almost 15 million homes that don't have some kind of father figure in them. Uh, so we're, we're struggling in a culture today, but thank God for the church. Thank God for godly men and uh, a rising up. And so we're so thankful. And, and, and really, you know, the church is a place that if, we're, if we continue to grow, and that's what we want to do as we begin to move forward in men's ministry, is cause us to see how we can stand up as men, not be pushed down, not be uh, uh, pushed away or pushed aside. 
Not coming back to a place where we think we got to show ourselves off, but really come into a place where we can uh, be an example uh, of godliness, uh, an example of leadership in our family, uh, in our church, in our community. Uh, you know, if you didn't have a, a, a father figure, if you didn't have a godly example in your home, then we, we gather around each other in the church and we, we look to, to mentor and to help people. And so, uh, really, fatherhood is such a, an important part of God's plan in our life and so the enemy's tried to destroy that anything that God makes that is good the enemy has come and through sin has tried to break it down and destroy it but thank God we have life we have the life of God we have the plan of God written out for us and so uh, uh, dads we honor you today make sure you call your dad I mean some of you I know uh, your father has passed on and you know you can just say thank you for what you've done for me Uh, if you have a spiritual father you can uh, thank them we do have God the Father and we get to celebrate him every single day I'm I'm thankful Uh, my dad just turned 91 Uh, he's still with us and and so I'm so thankful you know there there was used to be a plaque and uh, when we met um uh, behind them all there in, in the, the pastor's bathroom said the greatest thing that a father can do for his children is to love their mother. And uh, you know, today is not only Father's Day, but it's my parents' 69th anniversary. And so if they're watching, I, I shout out, happy anniversary. But you know, one great thing that my dad uh, always did for us is he loved my mom. And uh, you know, it's just a great thing when you, you can observe a relationship, a long-term relationship like that. And so I appreciate that. I know everybody's not in the same situation. I just appreciate and honor uh, that in my mom and dad and, and what is said in my life, the, the principles, uh, the honor, uh, the integrity uh, that my dad uh, showed us by example. He also disciplined into us in many fashions. It's not popular, but uh, gave us boundaries to live by. And if we got outside of those Uh, He brought correction to that in a godly way so that we could hold the course and keep our focus on what was right. And so uh, I just honor him today. I encourage you to honor uh, your parents. You know, my mom and dad slipped out with my sister, so I thought I'm going to do a great thing. I'm going to go visit them. Showed up at their house, wish my dad a Father's Day, and their house is empty. It's all closed up. I don't know what's happened to them. at all, so I have to call around, call. I asked my sister, are you here? Did you take mom and dad out for, oh, she said, I'm with mom and dad, but we're in South Dakota right now. <laughs> and so, for all of you that were praying for my dad at the end of the year, things are going well. They're just, they just jump on a plane and meet my sister and head off somewhere. Um, but praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, you know, just whatever you can do uh, to honor them, to let them know Uh, how much you love them. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we want to continue in our series of messages. We we began this series, Power Principles That Will Shape Your Future. And if you were here last week, really, the word of the Lord came forth and said, this time next year. This time next year is going to be different. So if this time next year is going to be different, we can't live in the insanity of life and think next year is going to be different if we just do the same thing over and over and over again. So there are principles that can shape our future that we can begin to really understand what we're doing. And so we began with the power of the seed. And so whatever you're sowing in your life, if it's bringing up good, good harvest, God's not mocked. Whatever we sow, we reap. Whatever we sow in our words, whatever we sow with our resource, whatever we sow in our actions, uh, whatever we do, it's going to come up with a harvest. So whatever you want next year, whatever you want to take place, you begin to speak into that, you begin to give into that, you begin to act in a way that that is true. Why? Why do we do that? Because of the power of the seed. God is not mocked. Whatsoever things a man sows, that will he also reap. As long as the earth remains, there's a law of seed time and harvest right? So if you're planting seed that's the same seed, if, you, if you've been bummed out, if you've been broken, if you've been distressed, and you just keep planting those words in that seed, if you're worried, if you're upset with people, then this time next year, you're probably going to see the same harvest. But if we plant different seed, if you know the financial plan of God, you, you begin to plant seed, things will be different next year as we understand the power of of the seed. We talked about the power of thoughts and and thoughts will take you in so many different directions. And so how we begin to understand our thought processes, a man thinks in his heart, so 
is he? And so, really, you can pray for me today. I know when I mention uh, what we're going to talk about today, uh, some of you might even chuckle that it's coming uh, from me, but we're going to talk about the power of emotion. I'm going to try to get in a couple of things here, the power of emotion. If we get to it, we're going to talk about the power of belief. So powerful in shaping our future. Emotion is something that God created us with. He created a spirit, soul, and body. And really, our spirit, you are a spirit. Many of you know this. You are a spirit. Sometimes we don't even give place to that. You are a spirit. God created you a spirit being. When you were born again, you were united in spirit with the Father of spirits. You have a soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, and you live in this body, right? And so you're a three-part being just like God. Your heart is made up of your spirit and your soul. And so your soul being your mind, your will, and your emotions, we talked about the power of a thought. It's part of your heart. As you think in your heart, so are you. If you don't doubt in your heart, but believe what you say. And so we've looked at that and said, well, I got something in my spirit. But often what's in our spirit causes us to say something, but then immediately in our thoughts, we wonder, is that mountain going to move? And so then there's a conflict that goes on. But if we get our thoughts lined up with the word of God that's in our spirit, now they begin to be, uh, uh, come strong. And so our mind, our will, our emotions, our emotions are so powerful. God created us with emotions. They're, they're powerful. Really, if you think about it, emotion, your emotion sets things in motion. Have you ever noticed that? You can wake up happy one day and the coffee maker not work and all of a sudden you set in motion a different course than you had planned for your day, right? You can just be praising God and all of a sudden be on I-70 and come up on brake lights and immediately it triggers emotion that changes your day, right? And so emotions are powerful and we need to really come to a place and begin to understand that God has really planned emotions for us but if we don't manage those emotions if we don't really come to a place where we're able to manage them properly they will set in motion things that will be destructive but God has a plan for our emotions to really be and I'll say this a couple times your emotions are to bring color and spice and enhance your life. Come on, they're there to bring color to your life. You know, I, I'm, I like sports, and so if you just think about this, you know, uh, you know here's, here's, you know, the old, the old school, uh, when we think about not much emotion, is make a putt, watch it go in, win a championship, you can't even fist putt, you, you walk over, you pick it up, you tip your hat to the crowd, you go get your trophy. That's where we get the golf clap. But all of a sudden, Tiger Woods comes along. And now, pfft, golf has color. Right? Can you imagine? Last night, buzzer goes off. And the abs... No, man, as they scored, there was emotion, and it brought color. And so there's a real purpose for emotion. But understanding emotion, understanding the powerful force it is, and letting it take us the wrong direction instead of the right will shape the future that we walk in. And so really, you know, our foundational text for this series is Jeremiah 29, 11, that God says, I know the thoughts that I have for you. They're of good and not evil, of a future and outcome. His future is about blessing. His future is about good things. His future is about that. How do we shape our future in that way? And so really in this place, John chapter 14, Jesus said this. He said, this, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, everybody say the helper. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Right? He says, the peace, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Right? So don't let your heart be troubled and don't be afraid. What did he say? He said, emotions are going to be there, but I 
have given you a peace. Not like the world gives. The world's peace is peace that comes when everything is going good. But Jesus gave us a supernatural peace. It's a peace that keeps your soul undisturbed while everything around you is disturbing. Come on, Jesus said, I understand that you're created emotional, but you can let your heart be troubled. You can get into negative emotion, but I have given you something to bring under control and manage this part of your life so that your future can become colorful. It can become enhanced, not dark, not dreary, not upset, not angry, but it can be colorful. Why? Because when everything around you is disturbing... I've given you a supernatural force that will keep your soul undisturbed. And so we need to learn how to harness that. We need to learn how to really uh, bring that into this place. And so, you know, we see all throughout Scripture how God lets us know that that people have emotions. We can read after David, you know, uh, the psalmist. He would always get to stirring up. His emotions would be all stirred up, and he'd begin to write about his emotions. But almost all the time, he ended with how God was going to take the situation and turn it around. He could bring the, all the stir of life and the feeling and the emotion and capture it and manage it, bring it to a place where God is still good and victory is still mine. So we see a difference in Judges. It says that, you know, uh, Samson, it says his soul was vexed. How many of you use that word to express your emotions? It says his soul was vexed at the continual annoying questions that Delilah asked him about his power. In other words, he started to get annoyed. He started to get angry. He started to get stressed out because she kept asking those questions. Because of that emotion, he turned and released the knowledge of his power. Come on, if we're not careful, we begin to get all uh, depressed or we get excited, our emotions, and all of a sudden we release the understanding of where our power comes from. We relinquish it through emotion. It also says that Lot's soul was vexed at the moral decline of Sodom and Gomorrah, yet he cried out to God. God saw the condition, and he delivered, through Abraham's prayers, he delivered Lot from that. We begin to see in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Timothy was in that state of being. He, he continually had to deal with his emotions because of the moral situation in Ephesus where he was developing the church. It was a pagan city. The church was rising up. He was a young pastor, and, and there was constant persecution and things coming against him. And so Paul would begin to write and help him understand how to bring that emotion under control. And so in 2 Timothy chapter uh, 1 and verse 7, Paul said this. Paul said, I, uh, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a well-disciplined mind. In other words, he was saying this. God has not given us a disposition of fear. Right? That comes from the outside. God has not given us a disposition of fear, of anger, uh, uh, of bitterness, of resentment, uh, uh, of uh, uh, sadness. He's not given us something, a, a predisposition to live that way. It comes from the outside. But God has now given us a disposition of his power and his love. Right? He says there's a disposition, though your emotion is a powerful force in guiding your future, God has given us something more powerful to begin to bring under control the emotions that come with fear. So many negative emotions come out of fear, how we respond to the fear of what men will think, the fear of financial distress, the fear of death. There's so many aspects of fear. And John said in 1 John, he said, perfect love. God has given us this, imparted into us this perfect love that casts out all fear. Why? Because fear has 
torment, fear, insecurity, not knowing what's going to happen will stir your emotions. It'll create an anxiety and a stress and an outburst of all kinds of things. And God said, we're not disposed to that naturally. That comes from the outside of strategy of the enemy. But what we are disposed to as believers is love and the power of the Holy Spirit to begin to deal with and manage the fear that might come into our life. In the same way, he wrote to the Philippian church and he said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Come on, there's something about that emotion. Joy is a great emotion. Joy is something I can tell on your face, you just really got it, that joy is something that really brings color to life when we rejoice in the Lord. He says rejoice. And then he said, let your moderation be known to all men. Let your fair-mindedness, let your steadiness be known to all men so that you're not all over. He said, be anxious for nothing. In other words, don't have a disposition of anxiety controlling your life. But by prayer, see, not only did he put the love of God in us and the power of the Holy Spirit, but he opened up access. He said, by prayer, supplication and thanksgiving. The peace of God, this supernatural thing that keeps our soul in an undisturbed condition when everything around us is disturbing begins to come upon us and create a place where our emotions now can be managed. It's a place, again, that our emotions really are to bring that color, that spice, that enhancement. But the moment that our, our, our emotions uh, depart from the place of color and spice and enhancement, and we yield over to our emotions to lead us and influence us, we fall into trouble. Your emotions were not created to lead your life. Right? And so this emotional part of us, we haven't really known what to do with it. God told us what to do. We haven't known. So in times past, in generations past, we, we just thought, you know, if we just stuff those emotions, we just stuff them down, that'll be great. Men, you don't cry. Women, you don't get mad. Well, that wasn't working too good. Right, but instead of going to God and figuring out how to manage emotions, we went to the experts and now we have a culture that glorifies our feelings and says that we should identify with every feeling that we're feeling. We should express every feeling. It starts to say when you identify and express every feeling, then that's how you are really releasing your true self. Come on, that's not true. And many times we release what we're feeling and then we have to backtrack and say, I didn't really mean that. That's not really what I... And we're brought to the place in our culture today where we've been told that whatever you're feeling is your truth. Now we really get into trouble when your feelings become your absolute truth. Why? Because we've already talked about that. Your feelings, you could w wake up in the morning and feel great. And by 10 o'clock, you can be agitated. By who knows what. And God says, I want to really help you bring those emotions into a place where they really aren't leading your life to and fro, but they're bringing the color and the enhancement to your life that God intended from the very beginning. Turn over with me to Hebrews chapter four. Hebrews chapter four, powerful, powerful portion of scripture. It says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It says right there that Jesus coming in the form of man, having, being a spirit, having a soul, living in a body, 
was tempted in any point like as we are, that he identifies with our weakness. He knows in that moment what triggers emotion in you. We have to realize this, that Jesus danced at weddings and he cried at funerals. Jesus was embraced and hugged and loved and he was rejected and he was betrayed. When he was early in his ministry, the one person in the whole world that seemed to know his purpose and who he was was his cousin, John the Baptist. And early in his ministry, John the Baptist was murdered. And when that happened and it came to Jesus, Jesus felt that loss. He felt it deeply. And he said, we're going to go away to a place where we can get alone. And when he went away and got into a place where he could be alone, all of a sudden he looked out and there was multitudes of people. And he turned that emotion from something that could be detrimental that he was feeling. And all of a sudden it says he was moved with compassion and he healed all of their diseases. They stayed around and he fed 5,000 people. He stood in a tomb and he wept. And all of a sudden he turned that into raising Lazarus from the dead. He showed up. The temple of God, the place of prayer had been desecrated. And he got angry. And it moved him to clear out the temple and declare, no long is this going to go on. This is going to be a place of God and where God can reside in his original tent. Jesus knew how to take the emotion and move him in a right direction that would bless people. When we have joy and generosity and and love and compassion, it moves us in a direction that is helpful towards people. And God put that in our lives. And Jesus said, I understand. Jesus isn't standing back angry when things happen and say, you know what, just, just stop doing that. Just stop uh, having that emotion. He says, I understand why you're having that emotion. I understand that right now in your makeup, when life slams you to the ground, when something unexpected happens, when tragedy takes place and loss, there's a part of you that begins to stir up and rise up and you don't know what to do and you don't know why you're in the situation that you are right now and all of a sudden there's a range of things that are going on that are pumping your blood and making you feel a certain way and wanting you to react a certain way. He said, I know that, I feel that weakness I feel and have felt that place where it seems like you're not in control says that Jesus came to a place in the garden where sorrow had so made him so heavy to depression that he was looking for a way out he said is there any other way out but he turned that emotion and said not my will but your will be done He knew what the weakness and how the weakness of the flesh and simply the emotions would really try to make him make a decision for himself to get out of the situation just like Samson did. But he said, no, there's a way to move my emotions in a way that will cause my purpose to be fulfilled. Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are. He experienced every emotion that you and I have, but he never let it take him off of his divine purpose in the plan of God. Our emotions show, shape our future. One translation I says, I believe it says, he knows your exact condition and exactly what you're going through and has the well-timed help that you need in that moment. He's not looking back, not knowing what you're feeling, not knowing what just happened, not angry that you're feeling that way. He's just saying, if you can bring that under the control of my peace in relationship, we will turn what the enemy poked you and and prodded you and stirred your emotion to be negative We will turn that. We'll turn your sorrow into joy. Your mourning into laughter. Come on. He said he would do things that would totally turn that. He said, I know this place. And that place, whenever he was in that place, he would get off to a place and he would begin to pray. 
And he would begin to call upon the helper. And we would see that he would come out of that place of prayer after there was anguish, after there was rejection, after there was bitterness, and he would come out of that place of prayer. And it says he was moved with compassion. There's something about that emotion, again, that that, uh, colors our world, that really enhances our world, that causes us to see that there's a part of our, our emotional life that God has put within us that moves us and sets us in motion in a direction that will help people and fulfill the purpose of God. Or it can set in motion things that darken our life and and make our life heavy. We want to make sure that really we understand that power principle of emotion and we learn how to do that. And so he said, I'm not, I'm a high priest. I can feel your infirmity. I can feel the weakness of your emotion at the moment. He said, but I've opened up access for you to come into the throne of grace. He said, whatever you're feeling right now, whether you feel right, wrong, or indifferent, if you're angry, you're bitter, he says, you can come in and obtain mercy right now. You can come into a place where that peace, that mercy washes over you, the guilt, the shame of whatever is going on, the feelings of all that can be washed away. And he said, and I will bring the power, the influence, the favor of my grace upon you at that time to bring in and manage those emotions and set you right back on the right track. What you didn't feel like you could do, all of a sudden by grace, you know you can do. Come on, there's not condemnation about having negative feelings, but if we let them control our life, they've gotten out of control. But he's given us a disposition disposition of power, of love, and of a well-disciplined mind and of self-control. And the world has said, don't control that. Don't control your feelings. That's your true self. That's your truth. But that's not true. He's given us for that very reason. He knew that the enemy would try to say, this defines you. This is your truth that nobody can tell you it's not true. He said, but if it's not true, you live a deceived life just based on how you feel. So I will give you the spirit of truth to help you manage the emotions and to know what the reality of the truth of God is for you, that you might not identify with your feelings, but you will identify with who you are in Christ, that the emotion that comes from that knowledge of who you are in Christ will bring color and spice and enhancement to our life. Come on. And so we're not walking around like robots, but we're also not giving place to everything that we feel. We are trusting in God. We're relying upon the helper. When we don't know what to do, we know where to go. Come on, there's a place where we just want people to know how we feel. We want them to identify with our feeling. And sometimes we're looking to people who can't. You know, when we were first married, Tasha would talk about how she felt about something. She has this phrase that she says. She says, you know. She'll finish talking about something and say, you know. Well, you know, I always thought honesty was the best policy. And so she would talk about how she was feeling about something, and I could tell she was feeling deeply about it, but she would end her sentence with, you know. And I would say, I don't know. I have never felt this way in my whole life. In fact, if you want to talk about it, I have no, you shouldn't be feeling this way. And that went on for a long time and it made her a little upset with me. I didn't even know what I was saying, but later we began to talk about it and she said, you know, I'm really not asking you if you feel or have ever felt the way that I feel. I'm like, then when I, that's what you ask me. She said, just for a definition of terms, I'm not asking you that. I'm just asking you to know and identify that I feel that way. I went, I'll give her a whirl. (laughs) But just my own particular, you know. We're all made with the same components. We're all just wired just a little bit differently. And there's a reason why we're wired differently. 
You know, uh, again, for a good reason, I, I know some worship people, and man, they're super sensitive. Some prayers, they're sensitive. They're sensitive for a reason. They're, they tend to be a little bit more what we call feelers, you know. But uh, uh, there's a reason, because when they get in that place of worship and prayer, they're feeling what's going on, they lift it to God. But if they're not careful, the devil will take that. And outside of that place of worship and prayer, they're always being bombarded with depression and feelings of doubt in, in themselves and all that. That's where we go to God. We bring that under control. So my disposition being just a little bit different how I'm wired than her, you know, it takes me a little bit to go, okay, um, you know, she'll end and say, you know, and I'm like, I need to think about this. I feel like a, the trap's ready to snap. <laughs> Moments you really need to help her. I'm like, sometimes I've had to say, I have no idea what you're feeling, but I know that you're feeling it. And so go ahead and just talk. Because, <laughs> thank you. It's not without many trials that we didn't come on that. It was certainly not a first time success. And still, you know, we miss it. But my point is, you know what, there's just times, but if we'll learn to really from our heart go to Jesus, he actually knows how you feel. And he felt that, and he felt the direction that it was pulling you. Yet he never allowed that pull to cause him to sin or to get off course. So he can identify, yet manage and bring that all into a place where it fits into your divine purpose and God's plan. All right, very quickly, we'll dive into maybe both of these in, in a deeper depth uh, at another time. But I want to talk about the power of belief real quickly. The power of belief. Such a powerful, powerful force that in Mark chapter 9, Jesus said this, all things are possible to him that believes. For the sake of our discussion, just this few minutes of discussion, I want to separate belief from faith for just a moment. Because faith is really a process of growing. There is a beginning to your faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes. Now, a simple definition of faith is believing, right? But there's a, as we see the scripture, there's an end to our faith. There's a beginning. But faith comes by hearing. So in other words, if we're not hearing the word of God, as faith comes, faith can also go. But faith comes, and faith, Hebrews 11, 1 says, faith is the substance of, of things hoped for or of our expectation, but it's also the proving of what we don't see. And so there's a process of development and increasing of our faith to the place that really true belief, just from this term, true belief is ending in obedience. In other words, if I start with the word of God and I say I believe that and I continue to process and begin to uh, first off receive that, that faith into my spirit, which is a spiritual substance, and allow it to affect my emotions, which is trusting him, then from the end result, now I end up in a place of actual action of obeying what God has said. Right. It's that place of finishing our faith. And so in Romans 10 says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's a, it's a substance. Hebrews chapter three in verse 18, it says, and to whom did he swear that he would, they would enter his rest, but to those who did not obey. We see that they could not enter because of their unbelief. See, he equates disobedience with unbelief. He also goes on to say that they had the same gospel preached to them as to us, but they didn't go in because they didn't mix it with faith in obeying what God had said. And so our faith, we start and we go, I have faith. But there's a place of believing that we come to this place of belief. And what does belief do? Belief actually unites you with the one that you believe. So the detriment of deception is this, is when you begin to believe a lie. When you begin to believe a lie. We saw so much disruption in our nation, and many times we went out, we, we would talk, uh, I would talk to our youth leaders, they would go out, and they would begin to talk to even some high school or some youth, and say, why are you acting out the way that you're acting out? And they would start to recite what others had told them, and then, you know, they would they would go to them and say, well, that's not actually true. And the, they would bat their eyes and say, well, yes, it is. And if you could convince them, like, wait a minute, wh why are you acting the way that you're acting? 
Well, because I heard something and everybody's doing it and I believe them and now you're actually enfolded in your action with something that you have believed. We see it all over the world, yet as Christians we're like, well, you know, I'm not sure if I want to do that. But once we have faith in God and it comes to a place of emotional trust, then action must accompany it to really be called true belief. Because in true belief, we yield ourselves over to God and his word and his spirit, and we become one in believing, so we begin to act as he did. Even in the book of Acts, they were praying about the word of God. They were praying about the boldness to preach, and they understood this oneness so much that they said, give us a boldness to speak your word and stretch forth your hand. They just knew when we're obeying you to lay hands on the sick that you are right there. We are enfolded with you. We've given ourselves to you. And so you are where we are. We are where you are. So James chapter 20 says this. He says, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect or faith was completed. So when God said, I'm going to give you a son, he believed God. He had faith. But God said, there will be a process to accomplishing this that will be on the mountain that day when you go to sacrifice your son. And so he had worked the process of seeing God. He had made mistakes. He, he had come to that place. God's not sitting there going, well, you don't have full-grown faith. You're not acting. No, he's working with us to develop our faith. Jesus was always working with his disciples to do what? Bring a true belief. Jesus was always trying to bring them to action. Jesus wanted them to calm the storm. Jesus wanted them to feed the 5,000. Jesus wanted to move them to action. And he says, listen, once you move to action, your faith will be great. It will come to a completion that not only do I say I believe that, but I've expressed it in my action and I have seen that God is right there when I act. Abraham, the father of our faith, came to such a believing that when he raised that knife, it took an angel of God to stop him from dropping that knife. He so was moved to action that he said, I will believe God right to the end. And it took an angel of God, not just a voice, an angel that says, don't you drop that knife. Don't harm the child. And God said, your faith, what you said you believed, you have shown me that you are 100% on board with this covenant. You say, well, that sounds like works. It's not dead works. It's moving from just a place of saying, I got this. I hear what God is saying. To embracing it and allowing it to grow and trusting it into action. John, the 12th chapter. Not normally really related with our believing, but just listen to this 24th verse. He said, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Other places he uses his expression. He says, if he loves his life, he'll lose it. But if he loses his life for my sake, he will gain it. What's he saying? Well, certainly many have related that Jesus said, unless I die, I cannot raise again and see all the people raise. But he's actually talking about a true coming to belief that says once we lay down our heart and we die out to all of our own thoughts, desires in the flesh and we plant our life fully believing in him the moment just as a seed is planted in soil that receives it and embraces it and causes it to die but to break open to take root and to produce fruit. Even as we lay through believing, we lay our life into his hands fully. 
He covers and by the Holy Spirit embraces and what's on the inside of you and what's on the inside of me. The flesh, the, the, the death of the flesh nature breaks off and now all of a sudden the life of the Spirit begins to take root in Him and from Him all things begin to be drawn until that life of the Spirit begins to grow up from Him and through Him and by Him and produce the fruit that will cause our life to be so full of everything that God planned. And the actions that we take from that place of producing are so great. The power of true belief, giving our life over in action to what God has said, is powerful in shaping our future. So it brings us into that place of that eternal life, that powerful life, that God kind of life that he's directed us in. Listen to this right before he leaves the earth. All right, I'm just taking a breath. It's pretty phenomenal. I've got these two subjects in. Somebody was praying for a miracle. I know we've just skimmed the surface, but I want to provoke you to some study. I want to provoke you to some things. Because if we allow our emotions to run us down the wrong path, our future will continue to have anxiety and stress and anger, and that's not the disposition that we have. But if we'll yield to the power of God and love and the peace, the supernatural peace, as our disposition of who we are as followers of Christ, we'll start to go down a road that we see people differently, we see opportunities differently, we emote, we live with joy. Our expression in worship, come on church, I believe next week if you, if you meditate on this, your expression in worship will open the doors of heaven even next week. We come in and we say, you know, my week wasn't that great and I don't feel like singing, but we realize, man, my emotions, whatever turned them, I'm giving it to God and I'm gonna start rejoicing. I'm gonna start praising. I'm going to start doing some stuff because I'm not disposed to whatever is trying to trigger that negative emotion. I'm disposed to power and love and of a sound mind. I'm disposed to the peace of God that's in my life. And that's bringing me to a place of true, totally yielding my life over to him because I believe that he died to break sin and its bondage over my life not just so that I could live a natural life and say I'm without sin, but he did that so that I could be broken and that nature and that, that what had, I had lived in, I would be released from that and I would be in Christed. That I would believe so fully that my life would be immersed into his. He would enfold around that. And now my life would crack open like a seed and every good thing that is in me, in Christ, would begin to spring forth. Mark 16, Jesus said this, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I'm gonna stop right there. We're on the edge, we talked about this this time next year. We're on the edge of what we're saying, a move of God. We're looking at a supernatural life. I just want to tell you this because I was praying about this and I almost forgot to say it, but I was just reminded. This is supernatural living. What I'm talking about, the power of a seed, the power of capturing your thoughts, the power of managing your emotions, the power of belief is supernatural living. It causes you to rise above the natural disposition of fallen man and rise to a supernatural life that manages the old man and his emotions and his thoughts and his uh, words that plant. And it, man, it brings power to bear to bring that under control that we might live a supernatural life. And from that supernatural life, some things come to pass. Come on, we're looking for a move of the Spirit, but He's moving right now in your heart. He's moving to help you manage that emotion that triggered in you this morning or yesterday. In your marriage, that thing that she said or he said that got you all stirred up. He's wanting you to say, bring that into, manage that right now by the Spirit of God so that you can have peace in your home and not stress and anxiety and fear of what might happen. He can do something. 
That news you got about your teenager, don't let it take that. Capture that and begin to see that you can reach out. You can move from love and peace. Come on, there's that place where we see it outwardly, but there's supernatural things going on right now. We're having a move of the Spirit of God. And if we devalue when He's moving, because He's not moving how we want Him to move, He'll stop moving, but if we value that, we put, he'll change our life. And when this time next year, he'll not only, our life won't only look different, but there'll be a moving of the Spirit of God that covers this church, that covers this city, that covers this region. All right, I got to quit because I said there was, I, I, I looked at the clock and thought miracles were happening and don't want to break the miracle. All right. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. These signs will follow those who believe. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick, and the sick will recover. What do you say? We, we were like, where are the signs? He said, listen, when you receive and you believe, you'll start to do something. And what happens when we start to reach out to lay hands on the sick? Up, I get fearful. What will they say? What if something doesn't happen? But he's not giving you a disposition, a disposition of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. So your belief is working together with the power of emotion to cause supernatural things to happen by your hands, by your mouth. It said after Jesus said these things, he went up into heaven. It said they went about and they preached the word. And he went with them. Why? Because they believed. They gave it to him. And he said, if you give it to me, I'll be with you wherever you go. And they went out and preached, and he went with them and confirmed what they did with signs following. Come on, we can shape our future by these principles. And this time next year, maybe this time next month, be living a more supernatural life than we ever have before. Why don't you stand up? Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, we release it to you. We've given some small, small things. Help, teach, guide each and every person here. Move on their hearts as only you can do. That truly, God, we might see how we rise above sin and the old nature that was dominating us into this newness of life that Jesus purchased for us. Move on every heart, move on every life, I pray. As we open our hearts to you right here in this room, touch every heart, touch every life. Every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment here. We've talked about these things, but if you are here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's the beginning of living a supernatural life because he paid the price for you. He died to pay the penalty for your sin. And when you accept that, the power of sin, the old nature is broken and you enter into a relationship with God. You enfold yourself into him, his life and his nature come. You're forgiven. Condemnation is washed away. Justification, forgiveness of your sin, the penalty of that is washed away by his blood and you have a newness of life and a freedom that you'll live with him and in fellowship with him every single day. If you're here today, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, we want to give you that opportunity right now. Just raise your hand really quickly. We want to pray with you. Anybody at all, you're here this morning. Anybody watching on live stream? I see that hand right there. I see those two hands. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We're all going to pray together with these two right here. When you pray, if you've raised your hand, just pray this from your heart. We're just going to help you, but it's from your heart. It says, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So let's pray this together. Say, Father God, I come to you this morning ready to lay down my way of doing things. 
I believe that Jesus died for my sin and that you raised him from the dead so that I could be forgiven. So this morning, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me from my sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory to God. The Bible says that now you are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Whatever mistakes that you've made in the past, he's washed and forgiven. Behold, everything has become new. It's a relationship with God. Now there's just a learning process of walking with him. So when the enemy comes and says, no, this is the way you are, no, say, I am not given that disposition anymore. I have a disposition of power and of love and of a sound mind. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, if you prayed, go on to our website, uh, share your story. We'd love to know that you made Jesus the Lord of your life. If you were in this room, made Jesus the Lord of your life, I'd like to give you just a, a little stack of mini books. There'll be altar workers up there. Just come and say, I prayed that prayer. Could I have that gift? And they'll give that to you. If you need any further prayer, uh, that something going on in your life, the altar workers will be here and pray with you. Amen? Praise the Lord. Say as we go, what God did in Christ Jesus? Far exceeds. Any damage done to me? by Adam's fall. You can be dismissed. Make it a great day. Don't forget worship night tonight. Good word.